Yes, all right. Thank you. Shall we bow our heads? Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you that you have always watched over us. You've always helped us. Even when we have been independent, you have guarded us. And now, Father, we pray that we may be to depend upon you fully, upon your Holy Spirit. And may this class result in the transformation of lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, I would like to comment on something I just mentioned in my prayer because it's so important. I'm here because I want to see transformed lives. Even if God has given you a genuine Christian experience, I expect this class to place you on a higher level. And I want to say that it's not because of the teacher. It's because of the subject matter and the Holy Spirit. This class may be the most important class you take here at Weimar. I'm not certain that it is because various of you have different experiences and so forth, but it is likely to be a transforming class because we're going to be studying the development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That development was under the direction of the Holy Spirit. But we're still here because we weren't adequately tuned to the Holy Spirit. And this is what we'll discuss during the term. And how can we profit by their mistakes as well as their the, the good things? There were an awful lot of good things that we could talk about. I have chosen to spend a good share of my time talking about the weaknesses. Now this is not to criticize. I have a great deal of admiration for all of the people that I will discuss, and this means all of them, because they were all good men. They were all, but they weren't all adequately tuned. They were not as dependent upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to deal sharply with the issue of how they related to God's Word and how He blessed them when they did and how at times because of pride and selfishness they failed to do so and were defeated and sent their defeat down the generations of those who also failed to recognize. Now, it is my proposition, and you'll have to testify for yourself when you finish the course, but it's my conviction that the messages that you will hear uh, during this class will portray the key, at least some of the key elements that are essential for us to rise above our forebears and receive uh, the Holy Spirit in, in latter rain power. This is our purpose in this class. Not just to know what happened here and who it did it and why, but to understand the nature of truth and the reasons why we fail to arrive at the experience of truth, even though we may actually receive the doctrinal truth, but still not have the experience of truth. And these are principles that I hope will be clear to you as we go through this class. Now I should make another comment or two while we're talking about the class. I'm always willing to talk to you personally if you want to just uh, spend a few minutes visiting with me if you have problems if you have questions now first of all if you have questions regarding grades go first to Gary because that's one of his 
uh, er areas of, that he'll be dealing with. But I'm also available. So if you go to him and are not satisfied, you come to me. You may not be satisfied with my uh, final statement, but that will be final because uh, somebody has to make the decisions and I'm the one that has to do that. But at any rate, feel free to come to Gary, to me. That's what we're here for. He's my assistant. He will be integrally involved in the class. You see him sitting here with you. He's already had this class. He doesn't, he doesn't need the grade, but he's here to help you. And uh, especially he is here to help me. <laughs> How is he going to especially help me by being in the class? Well, first of all, he is going to be here to listen to what I share because I will share some things this year that I didn't share last some things I may not share, but he will be here to listen both for your sake and mine because when we review your t tests, he will have made some notes as to what things I might have shared that are not in the book. The things that are not in the book, I will want you to pay special attention to because they're probably something special. Not necessarily because I don't uh, well, you find that I will read to some extent, but I, uh, as much as possible, I like to just uh, communicate the concepts. Uh, though in, it is in, in this place here, about three years ago or so, I, I think it was about the time Henry began uh, recording my messages that I had never used notes for my messages and my sermons uh, from the second year of my ministry. And, uh, but I was getting to the place where there were too many words I couldn't remember. And you'll find that I will have that same problem this time. Try, but not so much because I'll have something before me. <laughs> uh, it could be James White, that I, whose name I can't remember. Uh, these are not names that are, that are lost. I just can't get the computer to work right. And uh, so, uh, he will be here to make notes of things that are not in the text. And he may not always uh, be aware of what is and what isn't, but he will be making some notes. And those notes will be helpful to me. And in the processing of your papers, which I haven't discussed yet, I think I'm, I've gotten the cart before the horse, so let's go ahead and, and discuss the, the, the part that I was going to regarding your classes. I have decided, that is we have decided, and by the way, uh, Gary is a part of, of this class, and he's a part of my decision making, because I am asking him for his input, and I listen to him, and we discuss it, whatever it is. We have decided that we will have no quizzes. That is, if the progress of the students is adequate. If the process that we have decided on is sufficient, then we will not waste our time in class for quizzes and so forth. But we will ask you to prepare a summary of each chapter we cover. And that summary should be a page or two. Uh, of the key points of each each chapter. That will be for your sake also in reviewing for the tests. Now, uh, today's summary you wouldn't, weren't able to do, so we'll ha in fact we have to have the summary after the lecture so you can integrate these from your text and from my lectures. Could I upload the PowerPoints again to publicly? Oh, I guess that's the way we did it. That's really what I was asking to him. I, I talked to Gary about what we did last time and he'll, he'll do what, what is needed. I, uh, at the moment, wasn't quite sure how we handled it. Yes, that's a good idea. Now, 
we, I have decided, we have decided not to have a midterm test. Now that is not always a good thing because a midterm test permits two things. That, in other words, it permits you to have only half as much to cover. And it also uh, permits you to, uh, to do it one at a time. So you have, if, if we have a midterm, then the final usually is the last half. But this is the way we've decided. If any of you have serious complaints, get them to us right away and we'll listen to you. Uh, anyone who has suggestions regarding this class will be heard. It doesn't mean that we'll respond positively, but we will listen sympathetically. So if we do it some other way, that's because even though sympathetically listening to the suggestions, we still have a different conviction. So a midterm paper, you will deal with the Minneapolis issues with respect to the biographical sketches of the four major characters. So integrating in your paper will be sketches of each one. I'm not talking about a, a page on each one, but a sketch of the important factors of, of who they were uh, and so forth. And uh, you will also bring into your paper insights into priesthood of believers, which will be the dominating theme throughout this less, you know, course. Priest, P.O.B. is priesthood of believers and also paradox. Now, I'm not sure how much I will discuss paradox in the early uh, studies, but we will cover it quite thoroughly by the time the class is over. Yes? Um, that paper will be due on um, Wednesday, September 24th. All right. Uh, the paper for today's lesson he said will be due on the 24th. Is that what you said? Yes. And that's a Friday and it should be by by noon Friday. Wednesday, September 24th. Is that the midterm? It's the turning class. It's a midterm paper. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. I, I've, I mixed things up because I didn't hear correctly. He said the midterm paper. Yes. Okay, Wednesday. and that's why I, why I asked if it was Friday. The paper will be due on Wednesday, the 24th of September at class time. That will be in your syllabus, and I am, must apologize, I am not able. I think maybe, did you send the partial syllabus? No, because your office was alive. Okay. Um, I will email you the syllabus um, after the class. All right, now that will be a partial syllabus, but it, even the partial syllabus will be plenty of for you for now. But uh, we'll be dealing with the sequential lesson all the way through as to what the topic will be and what the date will be. We don't have that completed quite yet. At any rate, priesthood of believers and paradoxes are two uh, Principles. And by the way, I mentioned the theme throughout will be uh, humility. And uh, humility relates to both of these. So you have humility and uh, sub-headings uh, you might put, uh, priesthood of believers and paradox. Paradoxical thinking requires humility. And we'll see how that works. Now, uh, Marianne Hadley, as you probably know her, or some of you do, I see some of you from previous classes, and a number of you, and, and uh, probably not everyone. Uh, she is in the Pioneer Library, and she is an expert on SD history. I do not know the circumstances she'll be uh, under, because the library was flooded. The basement took a pretty bad 
uh, deal, and it has not yet been able, they've not yet been able to, to get her really back in operation. But hopefully she'll be there, and, and uh, you may um, ask her questions, get ideas from her. She is a, a wealth of information and source materials, so she will be very helpful to you. I've already talked about Mr. Gary Hess, whom you fellows know, at least, as a dormitory men's dean. <laughs> well, I'm, and I'm thankful for that. And as we begin this uh, lesson, today we've taken time for orientation, but when we, as we begin this uh, uh, class, I trust that all of you will find it interesting as well as deeply uh, uh, transforming because, again, uh, not the speaker but the message and the Holy Spirit who is the, the real teacher here. I'm going to just click, clip this back and make sure I get, oh yes, remember what I was going to do. Um, what I have shared there is that this class will uh, show how God raised up an Advent movement and presented to them a message that would finish and complete and conclude his battle with Satan between good and evil. So God has brought this movement that we represent, Seventh-day Adventist movement, into being for a specific purpose, and that was to bring the conflict to an end. Now here we are, 1844 was the great disappointment, and now we are in, in uh, 2014. And do you realize how long that is? Some of you mathematicians, James, how long is that? 1844 to 2014. Actually, I didn't figure it out myself, and I usually do. But uh, when in class and lecturing, I don't have the freedom of, of uh, my thoughts or elsewhere. But it would be from 1888 to 14 would be uh, 70, 170 years. Yeah. 170 years is a long time. It's a number of generations. When I was a boy, I knew that Christ would come before I grew up. And later, I was certain he would be here before I got married. And uh, I lived with my wife nearly 60 years, and she's gone now. And it's been nearly three years since. So. Time keeps going. It doesn't need to. God is waiting for a people who are ready to reveal his character to the world. And we have not been ready to do that as soon as God has a people. Christ's Object Lessons, page 69 says, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, the Lord will come and receive his people. So, 170 years is quite a time. God intended, had the people adequately followed and depended upon him, he would have and could, could have and would have finished the work in the first generation. Now, by the time the focal point of our message in 1888, that would be really a second generation. But now we've had some several generations between, and we're still here, and we'll still be here another thousand years. No, not really, because God will, will finish his work without, I mean, he will not depend uh, upon you. God will finish his work, whether it's with you and me, or not. He will finish it. But it is so important for us to
to be a part of that. Now I thought I was going to be a part of the young people. You know, Ellen White speaks about the young people helping finish the work. And that was my commitment, that was my idea. But uh, I have tw 32 great-grandchildren now and we're still here. And I don't want to have great-great-grandchildren. I am um, praying continually for God to finish his work. But if he's going to finish his work, the way he has to finish is in our hearts. Only when he finishes it in our hearts and lives can we reveal that message that he has for the world. And it will, last movements will be very rapid. Well, we're going to begin a discussion of this book, The Power of Humility. And we will be doing chapter 4 instead of chapter 1. We'll begin with chapter 4. And then I'm going to move to uh, uh, your, your um, light bearer's text. We'll do a couple of chapters in that. Then we'll come back and do 1 to 3 from this. But I decided, as a matter of fact, it was Gary's suggestion that we begin with chapter 4 of this book. He had good reasons for it, so I said, last time I didn't start with this, I started with uh, light bearers. But he thought it should be chapter 4, and I thought it was a good idea, so that's what we're going to do. Uh, later on, after coming back to light bearers for a number of classes, we will be using this book, Questions on Doctrine. And by the way, one reason why we're starting with this is that you probably won't find uh, the um, Lightbearer's book. If you, there may be some at, at the store, but you'll probably, some of you at least, will have to order it. I would suggest that you see if there are some in the, um, well, anyway, in, in the, Sending out by mail. Uh, it, what is the name when you Amazon? when you order books? Amazon. Huh? Amazon. Online. Say it clear, carefully. Amazon. Amazon. Yes. Thank you. That's another problem you know, and that is that my ears are far from adequate to pick up all the tones and so forth. So when you speak. Speak clearly and distinctly. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to be starting with ch chapter 4. And chapter 4, the title is The uh, Flowering and Fading of the Advent Movement. Will we get a list of what books we need? It will be in the syllabus. The one you'll get today. Thank you. Uh, those are the three. Now I may actually... If I'm successful in doing what I'd like to do, I will have a chapter or two from my book, um, Adventist Cultures in Conflict. I'm hoping I can because I think that is a, a subject that would be very helpful for you, but I do not know if I'm going to be able to weed something else out. You know, everything you put in, you have to take something out because you can't just keep adding to a course. So we're going to begin here with the, um, I have shown here, I think somewhere I put down flowering, but where is it here? My, going the wrong way. Here, the flowering of the Advent message, yes. I wanted to take a little time to talk about the flowering of the Advent message in the British Isles, in uh, Scotland, in Ireland, in England, in all of those countries there were uh, people, there were uh, people studying the prophecies in all other continents as well. But in the British Isles there was considerable interest in the studying of Bible prophecy and uh, when 
uh, the year 1798 took place, what happened? What is it? The time of the end began. Yes, but what happened? Oh, uh, the Pope took us taken captive. The Pope was taken captive. Now, when the Pope was taken captive, it was like electrical current that went around the world. In all parts of the, uh, of the globe, the uh, conviction was held by the different people, this is the beginning of the time of the end. And Daniel 7.25 is the first place it speaks of the time of the end. In chapter 88, it's referred to in two different ways, but within two, within three verses it's referred to twice. But this is the time of the end. And it stimulated a lot of public discussion. For instance, in 1802, when the Christian Observer, which was a newspaper of the time, Christian newspaper, there was a great deal of discussion about the 1260 years. But within a few years, the discussions shifted from the 1260 years, which had just been fulfilled, to the 2300 years, which would, uh, the end of that would yet, was yet to come. And in 1910, John Brown of England uh, uh, introduced the conviction that the 2300 days were years and that they would uh, span the time of 457 AD to 1843 A.D. Now the reason why that was 8457, there was a reason for that, and uh, that leads, leads us to 1843. The starting point was correct, but he used um, the um, AD, BC, AD dates as the basis so that he, uh, when Christ was born, he wasn't born on 1 AD, he was born on 4 BC, but they didn't know that at the time. So on the basis of what they did know, they were correct. Uh, John Brown gave a correct dating, except that it should not start, I mean, I mean I'm sorry, I mean, uh, he, he used this uh, on the basis of when he thought the, um, the chronological system was accurate. In other words, it was four years off. Therefore, he's four years off. <clears throat> I didn't express that too well, but that's the principle. Now, it wasn't long before a group of people, member here, somebody here, Austria, I mean, uh, Ireland, uh, Scotland, England, different individuals came to the same conclusion. They were studying, they had been studying the first angel's message, and now they began to study the second angel's message, come out of her, my people. Why, why did they uh, come to that conclusion? Because as they spread the first angel's message, it was rejected by the churches. And the churches actually were opposed to the first angel's message. Therefore, the individuals, one at a time, not a group of them, but here and there, concluded that there must be the second angel's message come out of her, my people, because the churches were enforcing false doctrine and refusing the light of prophecy. As a result, there were people throughout the British Isles who began worshiping alone in their homes. They would invite their friends, others may come in, but each one was a different cell. 
they were all uh, following the same pattern of coming out of the churches. But it wasn't long before some of these began to discover here over here and then they discovered there's another group and then there's another group and each of these were home churches which had uh, whoever was the primary person in the home plus his friends, family and friends. And as they began to discover each other, they began to form little cells, larger cells, so that several groups who were able would worship together. Now, when people ask them, what church do you belong to? What would their answer be? They don't belong to any church. Well, who are you? Well, we're simply brethren. We're brothers. Brethren is the plural for brother. We're just brothers. Of course, sisters would be implied too. We're brethren. Now, that's not brethren with a capital B, but, and I have a capital B here, but it's brethren with a low B because it's just brothers. It's not intended to be a, a name. Well, it wasn't very long before the brethren uh, began to collect in small groups and send out missionaries all over Europe. They were the missionary organization that developed to proclaim the second coming of Christ on or about the year 1847. I mean, yes, 1847. I think what I was doing was talking about about what happened in mentioning John Brown's and Brown's did not have that problem but most of the people in the British Isles did and so I was referring to this but it didn't really relate to this I think that's the answer to, to the confusion I was producing most of them had 1847 as the end, terminal end, but because they had not discounted the four years uh, of Christ's birth beforehand. Now, uh, as they sent out missionaries around Europe, there became more and more Adventist people, believers, those who were proclaiming the near coming of Christ. However, unfortunately, every time God starts a work, Satan seeks to counterfeit it. And it is best serves his purpose when he can counterfeit the very work that's being done, which begins as God's message. And if he's able, he will turn it around so that that very group of people will be preaching false doctrine rather than true doctrine. And this is what happened. What were the problems? Well, first of all, they had a false understanding of the second angel's message. They thought that the second angel's message was to come out of all organization. Come out of Babylon? Babylon was organized. Babylon has its uh, agencies all over. Uh, and they interpreted this to mean come out of organization. This is why they refuse to organize. This is the reason why they refuse to name themselves. They felt this would make them part of Babylon. Now, that means that they believed and taught that the moment you organize, you become Babylon. If you take a name, well, go back to Genesis and you'll find that the in the building of the Tower of Babel you remember they said let us make a name for ourselves now that is not a statement that we want to make a name that we call ourselves but we want to become so famous that everyone knows us and everyone looks up to us 
to make a name for himself. We we use that expression all the time. He made it. He went to New York and made a name for himself in the uh, whatever business or he does this. So, but their idea of this was that Babylon is organization and if you name yourselves by any name you have become a part of Babylon. Now that's unfortunate because that's not a biblical principle and we'll see a little bit later. Uh, their view also was that there be no human leaders. As soon as human beings begin to be, lead the group then it's going to go off and it will become Babylon. Therefore, there cannot be any organization or any leadership, any named leadership. And uh, they believed that if God leads me, he leads you and he leads you and the rest of you, we don't need leaders. God will him, the Holy Spirit will be our leader. Now, is there truth in this? Absolutely true. It's true. God intends to be our leader. He intends to be the real um, pro proclaimer of the truths in this desk. But he intends to use me to do it. Now, throughout the Bible, from Old Testament to New Testament, you search the whole thing and there'll never be a tame time when God uh, raises up a leaderless movement. He always uses men to do it. Now God could actually do the missionary work all himself or have the angels do it. He does not require that we do it, but we need to be involved in this and be led by him in our own character development. And they, people that are brought to the truth need to be able to hear it from those who are uh, of like nature as themselves. And our very experiences, our testimony, as we study the Bible with people, as we have uh, evangelistic series, it's the testimony of the individual that has the greatest impact in helping the individuals that are listening accept the message. There is no evidence anywhere in scripture that God seeks to have a leaderless movement. In fact, there's a huge amount of evidence that God uses leaders. When, when, the, church, when the Old Testament people, period, when the uh, Israelites reached a low ebb because of their idolatry and so forth, what did God always do? He raised up a leader and he placed upon him his spirit and he brought about uh, through the leader reformation. Now is this uh, a, a violation of God's plan or the carrying out of God's plan? This God plans to lead by the Holy Spirit through his believers. The Holy Spirit, you see, it's a union between the Holy Spirit and the believers that provides the witness that God calls for. And God always raises up individuals to bring about a reformation. Now, those individuals are not there for holier than others. Uh, they are not to be looked to uh, uh, individually for our salvation but they are to be listened to as spokesmen for the Holy Spirit to speak through to encourage us to respond so what really happened is that they were denying the spiritual gifts because when Christ left he says he wanted to leave with us his very spe most special gift and that was the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now he said, you stay here in Jerusalem, don't go out until you receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, what did he do? 
Well, he did lead the body, but he immediately organized the body. In fact, Christ himself organized, began the organization. And what we have when um, was that the Holy Spirit working through the apostles and through other believers it was the Holy Spirit that was touching hearts if there are transformations in this class which I expect there to be just yesterday one of my former class members uh, was expressing to me what a number of them have and that is that they, my class in SD history transformed his life in fact, there have been two people this week that have shared that from past times, and others have also. Again, who is it that transforms? It's the Holy Spirit. How does he transform? Through truth. Who does he send to proclaim truth? Teachers, pastors, uh, and by the way, of the gifts of the Spirit that included... Um, the gift of organization, the gift of uh, administration as well. And when you deny the Pharaoh, when you claim that any organization becomes Babylon, you're denying the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Because it's through the various callings of the different individuals. He calls each to a different work and he intends for the workers to come together as a body so that there is no, it's a seamless thing, so we're working together, but in all cases, it is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it is not a human-less uh, uh, leadership. Now, I'm going to be introducing in just a moment uh, one of the brethren who uh, I will not have good things to say about. But I want to begin by sharing with you a little bit about one of the key brethren individuals whose name is known and recognized to this day by many people. I don't know how many, but I am certain that some of you know his name, George Mueller. How many of you remember? So over half, two-thirds of the class know about him. But why do you know about him? Because of what God did through him. And what God did through George Miller was worthy of remembering. Taking uh, just a few minutes now, and I need to, I need to uh, check with you. I can't remember exact time we finish. Is it 5.30? All right. I need to keep that in mind. George Mueller, as a boy, was a bad boy. As a matter of fact, when his mother died, he was out drinking with his buddies. But one day, George Mueller heard some singing, was attracted and went to see what this was, and he, and he entered the group. It was a brethren meeting. In that brethren meeting, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart, and he, as a result, was transformed, and his wicked ways were given up and in 1832 he and a friend of his Henry Craik felt called to minister and they became the ministers uh, of a fellowship it's not a church you, you see this is a this is a brother movement so there's no church but there's a fellowship and so they became the pastors of this uh, fellowship. After they had ministered there for a period of time, they both felt guilty. The arrangement was that the wealthier people 
who could pay for the better seats did so and these seats belonged to them and they rented them so that when the church came even if they were a little late they could expect their pew to be open for them those who were unable to rent a pew were also cared for but in a, a not as good a seating area, not as good seats. They had to take the seats in, in the back. And as George and Henry thought of it, they thought about Joe, uh, James, where it says uh, that we are to be careful not to uh, 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 prefer the rich over the poor, and so forth. And so they went to the uh, those who were in charge of, of uh, organizing things there. And by the way, you always have to have some organization, even if you're not organized. <laughs> There's no way to get around it. And they said to them, we would like to have no, uh, no salary. We'd just be here to minister. And you can prepare a box where people can contribute, not out in the front, like you might expect, but somewhere the people know where it is and they can go to it and put some contributions in it. But there's no, no tax, no, no rental. Everyone seated uh, wherever they choose to sit. The poor, the rich, all integrated together. Well, they thought about it, and they said, that sounds all right. So they prepared the box, and they uh, discontinued the stipend, really, what they were receiving. And within a short time, there was not only much greater contribution than they'd had from the rentals, but the membership greatly and quickly increased as they entered into this. Well, God blessed the Bethesda Fellowship, their chapel, not a church, but a chapel. And as a result, uh, the membership multiplied. Now, in the meantime, Mueller and his wife both had a great burden for the orphans. And so they began to bring orphans into their home. It wasn't very long when there were so many orphans they couldn't possibly bring them in. So they, they made an orphanage. And uh, they did not uh, publicize, try to get offerings for that. They said, if we uh, are prepared to minister, Christ will provide the funds. And so that is what happened. That orphanage soon overflowed. So they started a second orphanage under the same principle. And oftentimes they would come to a given meal without any food for the, for the orphans, but always the food came. There was always uh, something there. Well, the third orphanage and the fourth orphanage. Finally, they had to build five large, um, larger orphanages than before. And uh, Miller, Miller took uh, a record of all the money that came in and of all of the children that they served. And they served over 2,000 orphans. Think of the tragedy of one location, 2,000 orphans. Uh, how many other places were there orphans? Orphans all over. And by the way, my, great, my granddaughter, with whom I stayed most of the time this summer, went to Bolivia when she was 22. She had had a burden for most of her short life she had a burden for orphans. 
and she planned from at least year 10 or 12 to go to Bolivia and raise up an orphanage. And the reason why Bolivia is that she had some relatives uh, who were from Bolivia and that gave her the burden for Bolivia. So at 22 she went to raise up an orphanage. As it worked out, because of legal factors, it takes longer to start an orphanage than a school. So she started a school. And that school, I wish I had a chance to show you, I never even thought of it, some pictures of it. That school uh, at one time uh, cared for 125 children, most of whom were orphans or, or were without a, one parent or both. You know, it could be one parent. Uh, in some cases, on children whose uh, background and, and uh, family background was such that they decided to t take them. But it was not a school for anyone who wanted to come. They were carefully examined before they came. A little later, they they reduced the number because they found that there were too many people who were coming in that, that didn't need it so badly but were heard good words about the orphan or about the school and so wanted their children to be in there so they didn't always represent things correctly <laughs> that is the human human element she did not ever get her orphanage but for some 10 years, I guess, now I, I would have to calculate it. And I don't have time to stop and think of when the starting point was. But for about, about 10 years she, uh, since she started that, during that term, period of time, she never did get the orphanage started. It's still a school, but she adopted, legally adopted 12 children. Three of them have, are old enough to be out of the nest. One of them is, is studying to become a doctor. Another one is in a college. And a third one has gone back to be with uh, some of his uh, relatives. And, uh, but I spent the summer with my daughter who has nine of them. The youngest one had the first birthday while I was there. The oldest one was about 16, so it quite a range of children. But God put in her heart a burden for orphans. Now we have to take a look at a, a, a darker side. Because they had no leadership, it is impossible for a group of people to be together any length of time without leadership forming. Whether they are appointed or not, there is going to be leadership. And there was one very zealous, earnest young man who was a part of this movement who chose to become the watchdog to make sure no leaders developed. And he was very careful and very perceptive about any beginnings of any leadership. And uh, he uh, was convinced that it was his responsibility, if that happened, to remove that person from leadership. Well, if the person hasn't been appointed to leadership, how can he be removed? Darby knew how, and that is to defame his character and to deny him of the confidence and support of the people. And under those circumstances, Darby uh, repeatedly, uh, individually excommunicated those he felt were wrong, but he had to do, prepare the way by, by uh, uh, presenting them as being scalawags or, you know, and undermining the confidence of the people in. There was one man there, his name is Benjamin Newton. 
you can find his works today because he was a scholar in his day whose works were significant enough to be aware of today. Of him it was said he was the man whose learning ability and piety outshone all others in England. But Darby recognized that people were beginning to look to him for guidance, which means leadership. Leadership develops. If it's not appointed, it develops. And so it was that he decided that he was going to go to the town where the fellowship that Newton was involved in, Benjamin Newton, and he went there to destroy the influence of Newton and to develop his own fellowship in Plymouth. Now why do we have Plymouth Brethren? Because we had a Derby back there. Plymouth Brethren, the name Plymouth Brethren has directly come from the fact that Derby moved into Plymouth and uh, defamed the character of of Newton and was finally able to drive him out. As a matter of fact, he excommunicated Newton and demanded that all other brethren, communions, and fellowships also excommunicate him. Now this is not the vote of a, of a body. This is a, a single individual who decided this man has to go. And this, when, when uh, Mueller heard about this, and the man came to them saying, could I join your fellowship? Because he was, by, it took two or three years before he could do it, because he had strong, uh, appreciated people that were looking for him for leadership. He didn't appoint himself. But uh, finally, they, became so confused they uh, lost confidence. So he asked for a fellowship with the, um, said it just a while ago, Bethesda group. And uh, they received him. But what did, what was the response of uh, Darby. Darby turned around and excommunicated the whole fellowship, which is the largest fellowship, much larger than his own fellowship. But he unilaterally excommunicated the uh, Bethesda fellowship for having fellowshiped. Uh, and by the way, in the meantime, there were a lot of communications back and forth and which Newton himself had to uh, uh, renounce several points of his own faith in order to become, because Darby had such a strong dominant influence on everyone even though they were not willing to accept this excommunication, they did request that he uh, renounce certain things, but that was not enough for uh, for um, Darby. Darby uh, refused to accept Newton and uh, never did accept him, and this resulted in a break. Two different brethren groups. One was called the Open brethren and the others closed brethren. Uh, Mueller and uh, Newton and so forth, these, those who were sympathetic with, with Newton and, and Mueller and their decision were open brethren. The closed brethren went with Darby. The interesting thing is that, uh, and I'm going to move back here, uh, the interesting thing is that even the open brethren allowed Darby to control their the theology. They were not willing for him to become a, uh, a tyrant 
and make all the decisions for everyone, but they were under his control so that the theology of the open brethren became contaminated by Darby's views. Now we'll see what those views were in a minute, but first of all let's see what uh, the development of this was. Uh, there was a, a Jesuit by the name of Emmanuel Lacunza who uh, wrote a book and that book was published in, in 1812 in Spanish language. The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty. Now that Jesuit was named Ben Ezra. That is, he called himself Ben Ezra. His name was Lacunza. Why did he take the pen name Ben Ezra? He knew that he would be in big trouble because not everything he was writing would be affirmed by the papacy. And so he took the pen name Ben Ezra. He believed that there were two resurrections and uh, that there are a thousand years uh, between these resurrections. And I see something else I just did today that I'll have to rescind. <laughs> My mind was asleep. I was not uh, at 1260 and after 23 and I'll, I'll fix that up. Somewhere. But he taught a day for a year and that's what the um, Adventists were teaching a day for a year. And so he got a day for a year. In 1826, Edward Irving reproduced this, translated it into English. And to that book, he appended a 194-page introduction. Can you imagine? A book that introduces a book. Now this 194 page introduction obviously would not have affirmed everything that was in the book and perhaps I have not seen the introduction but probably a part of that was in uh, uh, differentiating between his views and theirs. But nevertheless this was published at that same time when uh, Edward Irving had just finished translating he had a visitor in his home, and that visitor was Darby. So Darby had the chance to be exposed to Lacunza's work immediately before it was even scattered. Now the reason for his being in Edward Irving's home was because he was a friend of Edward Irving and they were both going to be going to a conference together. And so they bo both did go to this conference that was held that same time in 1826 in the home of Henry Drummond. Now Henry Drummond was a wealthy banker. And uh, I think it was in, in 1823 he decided that he was going to quit his political work he was involved in politics. He decided he was going to spend his efforts in behalf of, of the Bible teachings. And uh, so this meeting was held in his Albury home, which was an estate. And uh, for four years in a row, they, every year they spent one week with everyone who wanted to come and study the books of Daniel and Revelation, especially Daniel. Now it was at that time then that Edward Irving and Darby introduced Lacunza's work. And there are things about Lacunza's work that were very attractive in view uh, and including 
the fact that he believed that the Antichrist was still future, not the papacy, but the Antichrist would be a uh, papal uh, officer in the in the uh, pre uh, a papal prelate is what he would what he called it. So that sounded very interesting to the Protestant uh, brethren. Here's a, a man who is a Jesuit. And this Jesuit studies the Bible and comes up with the idea that the uh, Antichrist is going to be a uh, Roman Catholic prelate, which sounded very much like uh, what the Bible teaches. Well, <coughs> from year to year, they first of all decided that maybe there are two interpretations to prophecy. So they decided they would study both. But it wasn't very long before they did what others do, and that is to uh, cast off the day for a day principle and simply, I'm sorry, cast off the day for a year principle and simply uh, uh, identify the Antichrist as future. That meant that the papacy was not involved at all in the 1260 years. It required a, a considerable revision, but for four years they met together and by the end of those four years, they were no longer uh, uh, historicists. Now a historicist is one who takes the book of Daniel and recognizes that it portrays the history from his time till now and that it does so on a day for a year basis. So they were no longer historicists, they were now futurists. Now where did this idea of futurism come from? Well, it came from the Roman Catholic Church. And although uh, Ben Ezra or Lacunza did have some vital principles, he was, had not renounced the papacy and he had not um, had renounced his Jesuitical interpretation of the Antichrist. The standard interpretation of the Antichrist had two different interpretations actually and either one or both were accepted. <clears throat> and during the Counter-Reformation I may have to jump a little here. I see our time is just about gone. During the Counter-Reformation the Roman Catholics were under tremendous pressure because it's very clear in the Bible who the Antichrist is and and uh, they were losing their m members by the millions. And so the Counter-Reformation, they came together to determine how they could uh, restore. And they did it. There were two different uh, approaches to the Antichrist. Each one of them, either one of them would do the same thing. One was uh, by another Jesuit, Alcazar, and it was preterism. And according to that, Antiochus Epiphanes, we'll have to touch on this a little later, I don't have time to go into it, but that was before Christ's uh, ministry by 200 years. They claimed that this was fulfilled at that time. And preter means pre, preter. Preterism means that everything, that the Antichrist has already come, it's already taken place. And the other was Rabera, who also was futurist, but Rabera, uh, I, I'm sorry, was also uh, seeking to get rid of the onus on the papacy, but he put the Antichrist way into the future. And because he was way in the future, it couldn't be papacy. It had nothing to do with 1260 years, according to them. Now, <clears throat> Darby, put these two together and he said Antiochus was a type of the full actual fulfillment which would be in the future. So what he did was to take the preterism, futurism, marry them and prepare a gospel 
Darby, first of all, his theology was based upon dispensationalism. Now, I won't be able to explain much of this, but there are seven, according to Darby, seven periods of time in the history of God's church in which God saved people in each dispensation in a different way. Now, the two that concern us are the Jewish dispensation in which the Jews were saved by, who can tell me? By law. The Christian dispensation, the people are saved by grace. grace. You can see it's an antinomian position that if you're saved by law, if you if you're uh, if you were a Jew, you were saved by law. If you're a Christian, you can only be saved by grace. Well, the, I'll, I'll see if I can later on pick up a little of this, but the gap theory, just quickly, 457, 34 years, uh, that's 70 weeks are cut off, which would lead to 27, uh, 30, 34 AD with, with the last week from 27 to 34 and Christ being crucified in the middle of that week. They took the 70 weeks and then they broke off the 2300. It just stopped right there. Time stopped according to them. And it would not be started until the rapture. And I don't think I even got the rapture in here. I, I'm sorry about that. But the rapture, when the rapture comes, the saints are caught up and no one knows when or how, but suddenly the engineer is no longer at the throttle and, and the pilot is no longer there to pilot the plane. He's suddenly taken raptured. Now all of this is Darby's theology and that is what uh, present day evangelical theology is. When I read these, just identify these as key things in evangelical theology. This is the theology which we will be facing, I do face, and will be facing. It's Satan's counterfeit. This, oh, I do have the secret rapture in here. Yeah. And then, uh, what else? This, all these, Newton rejected these. And what else did he reject was the assumed right by Darby to be able to disfellowship people. He said that's the business of the local church the local church as a body has to discipline its members. Well, brethren and sisters, we're now three minutes past our time, and so we will bring this to a close. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. I pray for your guidance and direction in the lives of these students. And I pray, Father, earnestly for your Holy Spirit, not only to be present in our classes, but especially to be in present in the hearts and lives of each student. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.